rest of the webinar today, if you have a question, please enter that in the Q&A section down at the bottom of the page. I'll be taking that information and uh, sending that through and as I moderate with Jeff King and with Steve Abernathy. If it's a specific question for one or either of them, please direct that question to them. Now, before I turn this over to them, let me update you on some of the things that the WFCA has and is doing right now on your behalf. As many of you are aware, we made our membership free as of January 1. Our real focus in doing so was to address the installation crisis. We had no idea how ideal the timing would be to help us speak with one voice in Washington, D.C. It is so vitally important that D.C. hears the voice of the flooring industry, and we've, we've had the opportunity through our lobbying organization, Lobbyists, to have our voice very loudly proclaimed and to have some impact on legislation that has been going through at both the federal and the state level. We have been updating the industry uh, through numerous communications, over 20 that I've counted uh, in the last 10 days. And those communications deal with everything from the SBA loans, uh, PPP loans, uh, insurance uh, interruption to your business, uh, fraud, state-by-state -state guidelines, our Canadian brothers to the north and what's happening with them and how their government is responding. All of that information is available to you there. So please, again, access the WFCA.org website and uh, we will keep you up to date in every way we can. One final thing, we have made our online university, the WSCA Online University, free for the month of April. So please, if you are a member, uh, take advantage of that opportunity to see what's available to you. Uh, we will be looking at that, whether we need to extend that or not, but right now it is through the end of April available to you. Uh, first, I wanna turn this over to Steve Abernathy. Steve is the C CFO of the World Floor Covering Association. Steve and I have known each other for quite some time. He spent 30 years at Shaw Industries, where I spent 25 years. Steve uh, does, obviously, the financials for the WFCA. He also handles the HR component for the WFCA. But Steve is passionate about the market. He follows this on his own, and he's one of the people that I go to privately when I need information about how to read the market and what's going on. So I wanted to have him come on and share with you. And by the way, let me just state to you that because we don't know who's on this webinar that might or might not have been on the previous ones, we'll be doing a high level recap of many of the things we touched on before and then updating you on progress, what's happened since then. So Steve, if you don't mind, I know you've got a couple of slides to go through and then I'd love for you to update us on what changes you've seen in the market since our last webinars last week. Sure, thanks Scott and good afternoon, good morning. Uh, to all of you and thanks for joining us on this uh, third of our, our conferences. And um, yeah, I'd like to begin just first of all looking at what we looked at in the last one, more of a high level review and, and if you would, Lewis, put the slides up. Um, I had mentioned last time and I'll, I'll say it again that what we're experiencing in the, in the market declines, which is a reflection really of what we're seeing in the, the overall economic activity of the country, is, is not really uh, unprecedented with the exception at this point of the speed at which it's moved. Uh, we have moved down in the market uh, initially to the to the low that we experienced a couple of weeks ago. We've moved down some 30 plus percent, 34, 35 percent around that range uh, before rebounding and we have rebounded uh, from that. But that decline, if you look at this chart that you've got in front of you, the orange line represents the decline that started uh, due to the coronavirus in 2020. These other lines represent everything from the Great Depression of 1929 to Black Monday that happened in October of 87, um, to the tech bubble burst of 2000, to the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008, the Shearson Lehman brother uh, uh, fiasco, if you want to call it that, that resulted in a, uh, in a banking crisis and a financial crisis of 2007. If you look at the declines, the decline that we're experiencing now is not unprecedented in, in depth, but it is unprecedented in the speed at which it went. However, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, Lewis, I, I wanna show you that we've experienced this in history. This is a, a look at the markets all the way back to 1928, 29, when the Great Depression occurred and the crash uh, that, that happened at that time. You'll notice that this is a measure of volatility, just how volatile the market is in the time of the declines. And during the Great Depression, uh, we actually experienced higher volatility than we have seen in the, in, in the, the time period that we're in uh, today. So um, it's, it's not unprecedented at all. In fact, Black Monday was much higher than either the Great Depression or, or the, the coronavirus epidemic that we're in right now. So this volatility we're seeing in the market, it's also 
on the downside, but also on the upside. We're seeing massive moves back up in the markets. And that's just the, the uncertainty that everybody feels about where we're headed economically in the country. Go ahead and, and look at the next slide, Lewis. I'll show you that the treasury bond market is also experiencing this unprecedented move. The 10-year treasury moved to under, a, or it really got down to 0.54% on its low. Now it has since rebounded some from that, but this is an unprecedented low in treasury yields. Uh, and the spreads between the treasury yields and, and corporate debt um, is quite large. In fact, it had been growing and it really started to grow in this financial uh, downturn because of the, the, the risk that people perceived in bonds, both corporate bonds, uh, investment, investment grade bonds, and also junk bonds. That spread has come down just a little bit with the Fed's activity that's going on in the, in, in the Federal Reserve and also in the physical activity that the Congress has done. has helped to stabilize that somewhat, but 10-year treasuries are still very, very low um, in terms of yield. Um, again, unprecedented historical lows. We've never seen this type of a low before. Uh, next slide, if you would, Lewis. So throughout history, what I really was pointing out in the last uh, uh, calls that we had is that all the way through history, whenever we experienced any of these major, um, these major shocks to the financial and economic systems of our country and our world, for that matter, we've always rebounded from that. It's never been that we went down and didn't get back up. We actually may stay down for a while. The average recession is about 10 months, um, and a bad one is probably about 18 months. Um, and for the most part, we generally recover from that, whatever the situation is. I mean, you look at this chart, we had Black Monday, the Gulf War, um, the Trade Center bombings, uh, you know, all of those things, the government shutdowns, all of these things impacted the market on a short term basis. But all in all, they recovered from it. You move over into the Asian financial crisis into the 2000 uh, tech bubble that you see about the middle of the graph there. You had a decline, but you had a growth coming back out of that. Um, the Iraq war, subprime lending crisis, all of those things uh, ultimately were temporary in their declines and then we moved on as the economy recovered. We will recover from this. Uh, there's, there's no doubt we'll recover. The question is, is how long will it take and how deep will the recession be? And I don't think anybody really knows that. I think we're, we're, we're all looking at it and saying, how, how deep will it be? How difficult will it be to get things started back again? And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. Next slide, Lewis, if you would. Uh, this last slide here shows you that these bear markets are not atypical. The, these happen a lot. Um, but what if this chart shows, I really love this chart because what this chart does is it shows you that when we have a major decline, it is generally short lived and it is always followed by a larger, longer growth. And that's what you see in this chart going, this one goes all the way back to 1950. Now we'll give you the one exception that's not on this chart. And I wished it was, I, I really should get it on this chart is that is the 29 crash. Uh, and the Great Depression that ensued following that lasted for a very long time. We didn't reach new highs in the market for about 25 years after that. We hope we're not headed for that type of a long-term decline here. Um, I can tell you this, we were discussing this earlier, the Federal Reserve is attacking this in a much more aggressive way than the, the government did in the 29 crash. In the 29 crash, they took a little bit of a sideline approach and didn't really go after turning the market around or injecting liquidity into the market like they have uh, in this downturn. I think we learned from the 2008 financial crisis that liquidity is a real issue and can be the death nail, so to speak, of, uh, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an economy if, and, and banking systems and all this. We had a financial crisis in the banking system in 2008. Uh, I don't believe we have that at this point in time, and I, hope, I don't believe we will have that as long as the Fed continues to inject liquidity. Today, they announced another $2.2 trillion that they're going to put into the markets. Uh, and they're going to be helping smaller businesses. They're going to be buying uh, both corporate debt, uh, investment grade corporate debt. And they're also gonna be buying uh, even junk debt they had talked about putting on the books on the assets of the Federal Reserve. And they're also looking at helping out states and municipalities with funding some of their bond issuances because that's sort of dried up at the moment. And the Fed has really aggressively stepped in. When you look at, when you look at this chart again and you see 
the short-term downturns, the red part that you see here, you've got a 21% uh, decline, let's say there in the, um, lead, you know, leading up that 189% that gain that you see uh, that's leading up between 1950 and 1955, is followed by just a 21% downturn, and that only lasted a few months. And then all the way across the chart, you can see that happening. In, in, in 1987, you'll notice that 34% decline. That was the most volatile period in the market was in 1987, where the, the volatility went through the roof. The market plunged on Black Monday 22% or so, followed by some additional declines that moved us down 34% over a very short period of time. That was quickly reversed. And we ensued into a 5X plus 528% growth spurt in the market that took us all the way up to the financial uh, or the, the dot-com bubble of 2000, uh, not, uh, 2000 that ultimately burst, as everyone knows, and ensued a 49% decline from that. Again, that 49% decline was longer than some of the others, but it was, again, followed by a 101% gain, followed by you know, a 2008 financial crisis of a 57% down, downturn, which is you know, much more than where we are at this point in time. But it's been followed by, leading up to just uh, the first part of this year, a 400% uh, growth following that. So if you look at all of this, the 30% decline we're in right now may not be the end of this decline. I'll go ahead and tell you that right now. We've rebounded uh, about half of the decline that, that we've seen from the peak to the trawl that, that happened a couple of weeks ago. We've, we've, we've rebounded about a half of that back. That saying, I'm hoping and thinking with the liquidity and, and, and the injection that we've done here with all of these dollars that are being put to work, and, and literally at this point in time, it's well over $10 trillion, uh, just an unprecedented amount. It has hopefully stabilized the market and, and, and at least let folks know that the Federal Reserve and the, and the federal government is not going to let it collapse if they can do anything about it. And they are pouring everything they can into it. And I believe that's why you've seen this growth come back in the market about half is because we have seen that liquidity injection. We have seen them stabilize markets that were just in free fall. And how long it'll stay here, uh, I don't know. I don't think nobody knows. I will tell you this. I would be very cautious to think that, that we're headed to new highs anytime soon. I don't think anybody believes that. We need to be realistic about that. But at least we've stabilized for the time being, barring no major uh, uh, you know, changes of direction here or new information coming out about the coronavirus that's negative. I'm hoping we can stabilize where we are. Now, on the unemployment side of it, I think someone asked a question on unemployment there. Um, you know, this morning, the Fed or the, uh, the government released the um, uh, first time uh, new unemployment filings last week, and it was another 6.6 .6 million workers. And that's on top of the 10 million that had already uh, filed in the last two weeks. So we're now at about 16 plus million people filing for unemployment. And that has to be a big hit to the economy. The only thing that saves us there is what they recognized right away is that we need to provide some incentives for businesses to retain these employees. And that's where this whole PPP loan, this uh, payroll protection plan loan comes into play. Jeff's gonna talk some more about that here in just a minute. But that, that is a, a, a real lifeline to, to employers who are trying to hold on to employees. And I know many of you are thinking the same thing. How do we keep these good people? Well, that PPP is the way to go about it. And uh, we've actually been trying to do that uh, ourselves with um, uh, getting that loan. That loan is forgivable if you use it for the right things and you retain your employees. And again, Jeff can give you the details on that. But we, we tried to do that as well. Now, I know there's been some difficulty with it in that a lot of the banks, number one, they, they really will only lend, generally speaking, this is what I found, they will only lend to existing customers. So the best place for you to get a loan is to go to the bank that you work with. And hopefully they are a, an SBA loan, uh, approved loan entity. Um, there are a couple that I have found, really one that I have seen that I was able to submit to, and that's U, US Bank. They would actually accept an application or an inquiry form from a non-customer, but most of the banks will not do so. You'll have to go through uh, your existing banking relationships before they'll let you file. But the government is, I know there's 347, uh, $349 billion that was allocated initially to that program. 
And I think this, they're working on another 250 billion to be added to that. Hadn't been approved yet, but they're working on that. So hopefully that will keep that money flowing for folks to keep, keep employees on the payroll and get some help doing so. So that's kind of where we are. We've rebounded, as I said, about 50% um, and um, stabilized at least at this level. All right, thank you, Steve. And uh, guys, I misspoke at the beginning and told you to go to the Q&A section. I think we've removed that because we weren't sure that we could pull that information back up in case we weren't able to answer all the questions. So if you will utilize the chat button, please, to uh, post your questions, then all the panelists can see them and I'll utilize them as I'm kind of going through here with uh, Jeff King. Let me introduce Jeff to you. Uh, Jeff is principal with the J. King and Associates. He has been the legal counsel for the WFCA for well over 20 years. Certainly the entire seven years that I've been here, we've been to DC uh, probably 15, 20 times in that tenure and uh, have a, a great relationship up there. Uh, Jeff actually practiced in DC for a while. His relationship with our lobbying partner, Lobby It, allows him to get information and again, take that information decipher it, translate it, and then submit it to you. So we as an industry, we, we know what the call to action is. So Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you'll go through your slide presentation, then we'll follow up with any questions there might be. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> um, we're going to go through the slides relatively quickly, highlighting mostly the uh, new information as opposed to the uh, uh, the information that we did um, previously provided to you. Um, next slide, Lewis. <coughs> Um, the, the new key federal laws are obviously the first uh, Family First Coronavirus uh, Response Act, and that's generally to help employees who are laid off because of um, certain types of um, COVID-19 infections or issues. And then, of course, is the CARES Act, which is designed to help small businesses retain employees and greatly expand on unemployment insurance benefits. Next slide. The Family First Act, um, we've gone through in great detail. It's very limited on what you have to pay and when you have to pay it. It became effective in, uh, as of uh, April 1. So any layoffs prior to that time do not have to be paid for under this act, but any uh, layoffs after that time do. If the person was laid off prior to that time, um, they must, uh, they don't, they're not needing to be uh, covered. However, one thing that's fairly important um, is that the Department of Labor issued some guidelines and, and, and regulations in this. And what they said was that not only do you have to, the employee has to be unable to work because of these factors, but the employer must also have work for the employee. So an example they gave was a store that um, was closed because of a um, um, shelter in place order, stay at home order. Um, and the employees were under that order and couldn't come to work. The Department of Labor said, well, it's, they're not covered. They're not required to pay them the sick leave for that um, time because you had no work. You also were closed. That's a pretty significant limitation on when this will apply for most of us. So if you simply, um, somebody is quarantined, somebody is, um, has a doctor's order, but you simply don't have any work for them, you do not have to pay this under those new uh, guidelines. Next slide, Lewis. The family leave is also quite restrictive. It only deals with childcare. Um, but again, you have to have work for the employee. If you don't have work for the employee, then none of this has to be paid. Um, there's also an exemption for 50 employees. We didn't know how to do that. What were you supposed to file? And what we were told, don't file anything. It's a self-determination and you have to certify and be able to prove that your small business expenses and financial obligations exceed available business revenues and cause your business to cease operating at a minimal capacity. Which means you basically are shut down, but, you know, but for paying utilities and such and keeping your, your storefront. Um, you can self-certify that if you're under 50 employees and then none of this act applies. Next slide, Lewis. Um, you get a tax credit. We've talked about that. Um, they're not uncomplicated, um, but they are available and we can give you more information on that later. Um, if anybody knows it, we went through this in some detail last time. Next slide, Lewis. The other big act is the CARES Act. There are four major provisions for small businesses that need to be considered. There's a forgivable small business payroll protection program act, um, program, um, program loans. And we generally have been referred to, 
to as PPP loans. So the Employee Retention Tax Credit, the Emergency Small Business Administration Loans and Grants, and Unemployment Benefits for Self-Employed. So let's go through each one of those. Next slide, Lewis. Payroll protection loans, the big amount is uh, 2.5 times your average payroll expenses for the past 12 months, plus any EIDL loan that was made between January 31 and April 30th. It is unclear whether you automatically add those loans in or whether, they're, they're, um, or whether you have an option of adding them in. Um, the problem with adding them in is you have to spend 75% of the amount of the PP PPP loan on employee expenses to get it forgiven. And um, over the 10, uh, the 10, excuse me, the eight weeks that the loan's effective, yet if you have a prior one in it, how does that affect that number? We're asking for clarification. But generally, this loan is a two-year loan. The PPP loans are for two years. And um, it's a 1% interest rate, which would be much better than the 3.25% uh, that you're getting under an EIDL loan. Um, independent contractors cannot, can get their own, um, and it's up to 100% forgiving. Next slide, Lewis. Uh, the big update, the big, big update on all of this is you the pay to independent contractors are not included in your loan and your payroll costs. The initial law said that you included these a number of items in your payroll costs and the amount paid to independent contractors. The Small Business Administration has read that end as or. So it's all those items that we had referred to in our prior in all the out, uh, information we've given to you prior. And they've read not and independent contracts or for independent contracts, their payroll costs. Okay. You have to forgive. This is another big change. 75% of the loan must use payroll costs to get 100% of it covered. So there's also confusion over the covered period. The loan says it can co cover expenses incurred from April 15th, 2020, which means you can go back for payroll costs you've incurred already. The forgiveness section says it's for the eight week period beginning on the date of the origination of the covered loan. So it apparently you can get money to pay those back costs, but you can't get it forgiven unless you pay it for an additional eight weeks. Um, finally, there is new legislation. It got stalled a little bit in Congress as I understand today and is unlikely to pass till uh, at least Monday, but that would add $250 billion um, to the available loans. Next slide, Lewis. The, retory, the employee retention tax credit is essentially an alternative to applying for one of these PPP loans. Um, and it's basically, um, you get credit potentially up to the end of the year of 50% of your gross receipts. So 50% of all, if you have 50% of all employees, um, what you pay them can be taken as a tax credit. So if you have a normal, during this time period, you have a, a uh, uh, $250,000 um, payment to your employees, um, 125 of that is, is considered a tax credit, which means not off the, the bottom, but right off the top. Once you figure out what your taxes are, you automatically deduct the 125. But you cannot get that unless um, you do not take a PPP loan. Next slide. The next are these emergency loans. Essentially, they basically take away most of the um, risk requirements. They waive fees, they eliminate personal guarantees and collateral, and they make it very easy. There's no requirement that you can't get loans elsewhere. There's no requirement that, that the bank checks on your credit other than a base credit report. There's an immediate $10,000 to be paid within three days. I can tell you right now, they're not getting paid within three days. Small Business Administration is overwhelmed. I think last year, the Small Business Administration wrote $21.1 billion in uh, small business loans. So far, as I know of as of today, there are $91 billion of these loans pending. And some have been approved, some have not. Um, but if you do get the $10,000 and also a PPP loan, remember that $10,000 are deducted from what can be forgiven. Um, next slide. They've also expanded unemployment. 
and the, it's called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, PUA. It allows anybody unemployed, partially employed, or unable to work from January 26 forward due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. They can get on this. To be eligible, you have to be self-employed or not eligible for regular um, unemployment compensation. LLCs are, are self-employed. If you own an LLC, you're self-employed and are, you can apply for this pandemic unemployment assistance. If you're an S corporation, it's less clear. You may be eligible for regular unemployment benefits. My bottom line is apply for these. If you have reduced um, income because of the pandemic, which I can't imagine most of you do not, apply for these. Um, if you're told no, fine, but you can push for them. If you're an LLC, you should get automatically um, qualified under the PUA, and you may as an S-Corp as well. So please apply for them. Next slide, Lewis. State developments. We talked about some length shelter place orders. The issue there is what is covered and what is not. Um, is construction allowed? Some orders allow constru all construction. Some allow only emergency construction. Some have even um, eliminated almost every um, a construction job, um, but some of them allow you to stay open and continue to work, and you need to look at those. There is an increased business interruption insurance legislation. Um, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Ohio have already introduced bills that would require insurers to cover business interruption claims that uh, were due to uh, the Corona-19 um, epidemic, um, excuse me, pandemic. Um, <clears throat> that is a big time thing. They're basically saying, I don't care what your insurance policy says, whether they eliminate, you know, these virus issues, whether they, they require um, actual destruction of your property, we're going to make you cover these. We have put together a, a grassroots campaign. It should be going out um, um, uh, later this afternoon. We want you to push your states to get this coverage for you. The answer, this could be real money for you because this covers your loss of in, not income, but your loss of sales. And that's a big deal. So we have a grassroots campaign. If you're in one of these states, you'll click on the, the link. It'll list the state. You punch in that state. You list where you live. And you, the letter will come up automatically for you. You can change it if you want. Otherwise, you just send, and it'll automatically go to your state senator, assemblyman, and um, uh, representatives, and your governor. Automatically go. If you're not in one of these states, same thing. You just push on it. It'll bring up, a, again, a letter. It'll ask you where you, your address. Um, it, you'll put that in and bang, automatically, you will be, um, um, the letters will go out to your um, uh, legislators and governor, urging them to consider this type of program. Finally, I don't want you to forget there are state aid programs. I think probably close to a third, if not half the states have some type of state aid. Some are grants, some are loans, some are required extended lines of credit, some are loan guarantees, there's a whole bunch of them that you may have available on your state level. I lifted a website here, which will be also posted on our, when this is all done, this whole pre presentation will be posted. And you can go there and you can look at what your state offers. You just have to scroll through the states. Um, most of them will say SBA is a beginning and that's just the PPP, loan issue. But if you see the state listed more than once, they're providing, and there are states that do that, including some of the states here, like Massachusetts, Michigan, uh, Louisiana, that have special programs for you. And you can look at those and they'll tell you how to apply for them. Um, next slide, Lewis. With that, um, I guess we're open for questions. We can get rid of the slides and, and start answering things. All right, Jeff, I've got a couple of questions that have already been submitted, but let me just go ahead and clarify one thing. You're saying, uh, when in doubt, go ahead and apply. When in doubt, go ahead and apply. Yeah, so if, if you have employment, or you doubt, go ahead and apply for the two. Everybody should apply for the emergency EIDLs, and everybody should apply for a PPP loan. And at least at the, at the end of the PPP loan, um, if you get that, you should all, in fact, you don't even have to wait in the meantime to apply for an employment. Once a PPP loan comes in, you're going to be paying yourself then. You need to explain you're not going to. You're going to come off unemployment, and then you're going to reapply afterwards. Okay. All right. Marty Cohen asked a question. He said he's been getting different information from various sources on the time period for calculating the PPP loans. 
Uh, some say January 1st, uh, 2019 through 1231, 2019. You mentioned the past 12 months. Can you give some clarity to that, please? The law and the regulations say to the year, it says year, not actually 12 months, the year before the loan is provided, which is not feasible because you're going to make an application before the loan is provided, but it is a year before it. So it's basically probably a year before you apply. The confusion comes in is that you also have to make a comparison to how many employees you paid um, for. And uh, under those aspects, they don't use the prior year. You're applying based upon your prior year average employment um, payroll costs, but they're actually going to look at the number of full-time employees you had um, during the eight weeks and then compare that to the number of full-time employees you had, and you get to pick either February 25th, uh, 2019 to June 30th, 2019, or January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020. So you have to the, the idea is to keep as many employees as you, use, you usually have, and they let you pick whether it was last year's, first half of last year, or the first two months of this year. But the loan itself, that calculation is based upon the prior 12 months. And Marty, that information again is available on the website. So if you need clarity or a recap of what Jeff just mentioned, that's already out there. I'm gonna stay on that topic for just a moment. And then Gary, I'll go back to your question. But uh, he has a, uh, Kelly Murphy has a question on PPP and the 1099 contractors. And there was some change in this. You mentioned it in your presentation, uh, Jeff, but it, at first they made it appear you could count 1099 employees in your calculation. They have now changed that. Can you give clarity to that as well, please? The original statute, the CARE statute reads, payroll costs include, and then it said, A, the sum of, and it listed, all, excuse me, it listed all those things that were included. Um, you know, payroll costs, uh, the healthcare costs, um, those aspects to it, um, retirement costs, um, state tax, uh, payroll taxes, etc. And then it said, end, amounts paid to independent contractors, sole proprietors. Um, and so we assume the end main meant end. Well, the Department of Labor, since independent contractors and sole proprietors can also get PPP loans, they've interpreted to say, or. So it means you can include all these expenses, but you can't include independent contractors because independent contractors can get their own loans. They can file separately. Yeah. So, uh, and that, that is a change. And guys, I just reiterate, much of this is fluid. So once you hear legislation has been passed, that doesn't mean it's finalized. A lot of clarity comes to it after the legislation has passed. Gary Solomon asked this question. He says he filed for business interrupted insurance and has already been turned down in New Jersey. Uh, what would you tell him? I mean, we, we understand right now it's not been approved. We're telling people to continue to lobby so that it will be included. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I'm glad, Gary, I'm glad you filed because that makes your claim on file. You have it. And most insurance policies require you to file in a certain time period. Some of them are short, some a little longer. Um, but the fact that you filed, you now have a claim on file. So once this law, if this becomes law, um, is uh, uh, provided, is passed, you will automatically have that right. There's also lawsuits going on. They're going to be class actions that may find coverage for you. Finally, there's a federal law with the insurance companies are backing, asking for the kind of relief that they got uh, um, during 9-11, uh, where they were allowed to pay a lot of claims that would not normally, they would not have had the finances to pay. And we're supporting that to the extent that they will expand the coverage of um, business interruption insurance as well. But that bill is kind of stalled right now. We, we're, so we're pushing these state bills at the moment. We eventually will, if that bill moves forward, we'll be pushing again, maybe with some, uh, another letter campaign on the federal level. And Jeff, you might speak to the power that states have in impacting insurance carriers. Well, th there's going to be a litigation over some of this. Don't get me wrong. It's, uh, so this may not be immediate relief. I apologize. But so you could see a, a long delay in getting this based upon lawsuits and such, but it would be awful nice as you're recovering to suddenly get a check for your lost business. Yeah. Um, so, but the answer is, is that some companies in these states are going to say, whoa, 
I have the right to contract under the U.S. Constitution. And the states are going to say, absolutely. And we have the right to regulate insurance. And they have the absolute right under the McLaren Act, um, a federal McLaren Act, to regulate insurance policies and insurance payments. Okay. Uh, Jeff, Michael Birnbaum asked, if you receive PPP payment but are still closed due to a state directive, can you delay initiating the eight-week payroll resumption period until you're allowed to resume conducting business? Uh, it's not as clear as I'd like it to be. Um, the reality is, is that it says um, the eight weeks start from the time you get the loan. So it lets sound. It doesn't say you have to do it. We've even asked, can you do it intermittently? Look at it. Um, it's not clear, but my answer is probably not. But you don't have to bring your employees back. The idea is to keep the relationship and the payments going. So the idea is to pay these expenses and just say, we love you guys. We want to... You know, we had this opportunity to get some funding to make sure you were you were covered as well as us, and we're, so you're getting your, you're going to get your normal paychecks for the next eight weeks. Yeah, part of the government's directive in this, Jeff, is to keep them employed so that they don't go on to unemployment. Is that correct? That's, that's exactly right. And some may be on unemployment. You provide this, they'll go off of it for the eight weeks and come back on it eventually, unless some of this is extended, which is quite possible it could be. So. Uh, Jeff, I have uh, uh, one here that says, I've been advised by my CPA to not apply for anything beyond the PPP, which excludes subcontractors. How would you respond to that? Um, I'm not sure I agree with your CPA. It depends on, but everything depends on your personal finances. Um, and I will, and I need to, uh, I need to look at those and more likely you see a good uh, account needs to look at those. The reality is, is that, um, it depends on what you need. If you can get by with a PPP loan, you might as well just take it because it's 100% forgivable. The emergency loans are not. Um, they're going to move over to it, uh, to, to, the, uh, um, uh, to a normal three, I think it's um, 3.25 or 3.75 interest rate um, over a, I believe, a 10 year period. Um, you're going to be stuck with that loan and you're going to have to pay that loan back. Um, so if you don't need it, why incur it? On the other hand, um, you know, the answer is you need money instantly. You apply for the loan. There's supposed to be this three, this $10,000. But again, that's really not technically forgivable because it's going to be deducted from whatever is forgiven on your PPP loan. So that's where I think your account may be coming. I'd like to know the reasons he's mentioned that, but I certainly would, uh, uh, um, I certainly think I can understand what he's saying. If you don't need the money, don't get yourself tied up with multiple loans. Yeah, and I, let me reiterate here, guys, that uh, Jeff is not licensed, obviously, to practice in every state in the United States, and that's not possible, or north of the border. We're giving this advice to give you direction so that you can go back to your experts and, and partner with them. So I'm glad you're contacting your CPA. I'm glad you're talk, contacting your legal teams and asking them for clarity on these subjects so that you do have directive on what needs to be done. Uh, here's a good question, Jeff. What if you haven't been in business for a full year yet? Can you still apply for any of these? And this particular person has no other employees. They're self-employed. Uh, the answer is yes, you can. Um, uh, if you've not been in business for a full year, then you take your average, um, the average amount of your, of your payroll from, Jan I believe it's January 1, 2020 through February 20. Uh, 29th, 2020. I want to go back. I'll have to go back and check that for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Um, off the top of my head is that it's based upon, um, if you haven't been in full year, then you take the average of that time period. Um, I'd like to go back and check it beforehand. So, um, hey, and Jeff, I, you know, you've answered that question before. So that is on our website. I believe it is on our website as well. Yeah. Uh, hey, Scott. Yes. Scott. Yes, just to uh, interject one thing on the calculation of the payroll. I looked at this the other day as we were uh, trying to put together the numbers. The, they made a clarification on the calculation of your payroll dollars. There is one thing you have to exclude in the, in the dollar value, and that is the employer's portion of the FICA, the Social Security, Medicaid, and the um, uh, Social Security portion of it. It's the 7.65% that all employers have to contribute. That has to be excluded from the calculation because that is an employer um, liability. And so they, they you got to take that out of the number when you, when you submit your calculation. Uh, Steve, that's a good point. But you also have to take out any um, 
uh, income tax you collected on behalf of the employee as well. You have to take that out as well. Um, you, so there are some adjustments you have to, um, to make when you, what's included, what's not included. Um, yeah. I'll give you a good tip on that too. If you use any of the payroll processors like ADP or one of those companies, uh, ADP it has a calculator within their, their platform that allows you to do that. And it takes into account all of those things. So uh, I would look to utilize those tools if you're using one of the uh, payroll services out there. There's one other thing you need to take out as well, but, and this is a little more complicated. So it se essentially it includes everything but um, payments to independent contractors, Correct. payroll taxes, um, and th your portion of those payroll taxes, um, federal income taxes um, that you've collected. But also, if you've paid sick or family leave under the Family First Act, you're getting credit for those and you have to deduct those two. Now that only cover for, uh, you know, two to, two to 10 weeks of it, but you have to take that out. And finally, for any employee, including yourselves, who make over $100,000, you have to deduct that excess amount. So if you made 150, you have to pull 100 grand off of it. That's that helps yeah. clarify that. Correct. And Jeff, it's also true that you can include, I believe, um, benefit programs like health insurance in that calculation, yes. as well as uh, contributions to retirement plans. You can. Uh, uh, you include tips and their equivalent vacation month to pay if you've paid that, um, uh, any kind of uh, insurance benefits. Some banks have held, however, and we're still trying to get clarification. That doesn't seem to be what the law says. Um, we talked about health care benefits, including insurance premiums. Some people give a stipend, and you can use that for anything you want. And the banks are sitting, I'm not sure that's covered because it's not technically tied to a health care benefit. Um, so be aware of that. But if you have a severance payment you've, inc you've included, so somebody was terminated, and you paid them an extra month pay, you get to include that as well. I know our audience is primarily professional flooring dealers, but this is a great question. I got this via email early today too. How would you, uh, what would you tell our subcontractors and installers? What do they need to file? They can get an immediate PPP loan. Okay. Um, and they should apply for it. And it may, if they're a sole proprietor, it's just their income and their, and their business costs um, with the costs that are required to be done. The bank will lead you through it. But as Steve mentioned, for example, um, Wells Fargo, I, they don't care if you have an account with them any, any at all. Um, by Friday afternoon, they were taking no more applications whether you have an account. I have five accounts with them, um, including a, a stock account, and they wouldn't even take my application at the moment. We're, we're dealing with that now. Wow. Um, so all of this is, is up in the air. So don't get me wrong, I think, answer. But you can apply for it. You're gonna need your 1099s to show what you made, to verify it. You're going to submit what that income is. If you have multiple crews you work with, in other words, it's you and a bunch of guys or women, then you can add all of those costs in and have it done and you can pay it out. Um, um, if you're an LLC, then you'll include all of those folks and you also are considered eligible for it as a sole proprietor. So the answer is I, um, I would apply for a PPP loan. You can also apply for one of these emergency loans and if you're a sole proprietor, if that means you're an LLC or simply a, an individual sole proprietor, you have an absolute right to also apply for an employment once you've gone through the PPP loan amount or prior to and after. Uh, Jeff, I think I know the answer to this one, but uh, the, Tammy asked, my business insurance specifically excludes losses from viruses. Should I still file a claim? We're telling them, yes, file the claim anyway, because that may be changing based on uh, state legislation, correct? I think that's absolutely correct. Um, there's also an argument that um, you're closed not just because of the um, of the virus. You're closed because your um, store could be contaminated, and that's a physical damage to your store. And that's been a claim made by a bunch of people where they have the virus exclusion. Some of them are written in a matter that um, they say a viral inclusion that includes infection in the store. You know, in your facilities, do not count. Um, some just say they don't cover virus and pandemics. Um, but there's been a push on that, that you, your store is physically damaged by the fact um, that it is susceptible to being damaged by having the, infect, the infectious virus in your store and on your surfaces and on your, uh, particularly, uh, as you know, and things are held differently 
carpet may hold it longer than um, certain aspects to it. Um, you know, there's all sorts of factors that could, you could argue damage your store. So file it anyway. I don't know how hard I push it now, um, but I would push your state to get those laws in effect because those would make a big difference for you all. Uh, Jeff, a good friend of mine, John Staff, asked, can we work employees 60 to 80 percent and still have the payroll forgiven? You can, but when you're <coughs> witness, it's going to be based upon what your average payroll was in the prior, uh, prior period and what you get to compare it to. So if you're paying them at 75 percent um, and you, that means you only use 60 percent of the loan for payroll costs, um, then you're going to have less forgiven. Yeah, that's all that's forgiven is that portion. That, that portion, um, it, it's, it reduces it. So it's whatever 60% is divided by 75% will tell you how much of your loan is not forgivable. Um, but if you can also pay them the full amount at this point under that loan program, and then, then it, um, that would not run that risk. Okay. Jeff, uh, Lou Ann Thompson asked, and I'll go ahead and answer this. Uh, how do we link into the grassroots campaign by state for the business interruption insurance? Uh, we will have a communication going out, Lou Ann, later today that will tell you exactly how to do that. If you don't happen to get that communication, uh, look for us on social media, on any of the social media, or certainly go to our website, wfca.org, and you'll be able to access that information through our website as well. And, and this is a seamless process, basically. If you're one of the five states, it's going to come up and say, you know, give you a list of state. If you're not, you don't even have to list your state. You're just going to click on it. You're going to put your address in it. It's going to automatically fill the letter up. Um, and then it's going to go out. And it's going to be emailed out as if it comes from your account. Uh, John Staff, again, I'm not sure I understand this question. It says, can they use their vacation pay to fill out their paycheck? So if you're only paying them a percentage of their regular pay, can their vacation pay fill out the remainder of the paycheck, I think is, is what he's asking. I want to go back and look at that on the PP loan, but my recollection, because that's not been a question I've seen before. Um, and again, this is a 886 page law <laughs> um, with the same inconsistencies as you've already seen here. Um, uh, some serious inconsistencies we're trying to clarify. But um, the, uh, my recollection is you cannot. Um, this is meant to be in addition to, uh, not in uh, lieu of um, uh, existing, pay, um, uh, what do we call personal time off is the easiest way to do it, whether it's sick pay or, or um, uh, vacation pay. Jeff, uh, Barbara just sent this message back, <laughs> so <she laughs> message to the insurance agent. With the interrupting. Yeah, go ahead. Jeff, you got me? Yeah, I just wanted to write myself a note on vacation pay versus PPP loan. Okay. Great. Uh, she asked, yeah, she just messaged her insurance agent and he said, what would the claim be? So she's, she's filing for the business interruption insurance. Obviously, that's not covered. Viruses are not covered under that. What would the claim be currently? She would claim for business interruption claims and it will get denied. Okay. But just file it. Your agent's going to tell you what's well, not going to, it's going to get denied. Tell them I don't care. I want to file it. And Jeff, I've heard you say before, the first to file may matter. So go ahead and get your name on the roster. It's not as much the first to file. It's that the, there's going to be a limited amount of money here. And the reality, you know, the, the, the insurance companies could go broke unless there's some, some aid given to them. Um, they claim that um, they collected $79 billion in premiums, and this will cost $580 billion if they had to cover all of this. So they're claiming this is it will bankrupt them all. I don't, I think their numbers are way off. Um, so do most people think they're way off. They will probably get some congressional relief over the long run. But more importantly is that um, the reality is they do have time limits on when you can file a claim. And those time limits will allow you to relate back to so many losses so far back. Some are 30 days, some are 90 days, some are 180 days. I don't, you have to look at your policy. But I have a feeling that if they do this, they're going to tell you that you can, um, that you're cut off. You didn't file your claim in time. They're going to use that as another excuse. So get them in, and at least you beat you beat the deadline. And um, we'll see where the chips fall as these this laws lawsuits and such um, move forward. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Charles had asked about, uh, again, restating what items that you could not include in your payroll calculation. Steve, I think the link that you provided is a response to that, correct? Yes, it is. I was going to mention that. So um, I posted in the chat, if you just want to copy that and drop it into a browser, you'll get access to it. It is a brief that was done by ADP that's a really nice summary of the things that are included and the th things that are excluded from the calculation. Uh, of payroll for the PPP loan. It's really a nice little one pager that'll give you most of that uh, information in, in the chat window. Also on the website, you can go in and there's a summary of the new regulations that lay out essentially by who's, who's eligible, what's, what's included, what's not included, that's all laid out um, in a sort of an outline form, everything you need to know about the PPP loans. Um, and it's broken down by, I'd have to go back and look at it, but I think it says, who's eligible, what's the maximum amount you can get, how do you add it up, what's included in payroll costs, what's forgivable, how much is forgivable, how do I pie for it, and all those types of things are laid out for you as well um, in, that, uh, in that short memo. Jeff, will you speak for just a moment to essential versus non-essential employees and, and how states have various uh, interpretations of that? Yeah, it's a uh, Essential employees are, are exempted from the rule, okay? Um, in some states, um, I believe it's Vermont, said all construction is essential. I believe Nevada has said all construction is essential. Some states, um, such I believe as uh, New Hampshire, and, recent, and many local rules basically say only emergency construction or completion of a of dangerous open site construction is is essential. Mm -hmm. So you know, some if you have construction a, a floor partially installed, arguably you have to complete that. Otherwise, there's a danger to it. If you have um, if somebody has uh, some kind of a, a leak in their property that warps their floor, or causes some real damage to the carpeting that could create a danger, then that's obviously a, a health or uh, or safety uh, issue, and you can go in to do it. I don't know of any state or locality that says you can't go in for any type of construction, um, but you have to go to that local state or end, not just or, end, local um, uh, county and town and city uh, orders to determine whether you're included or excluded as an essential business. Again, I will tell you, almost all of you are included to some degree. Uh, Doug Katz just asked, in a stay-at-home state, can you require employees to use paid vacation time? Um, you, you, the answer is, is um, you can if you haven't um, uh, laid them off. Um, uh, you can mandate that they use that first. Um, if you furloughed them, that may be a tougher issue because the furloughs are saying, you we have no work for you at the moment in bulk, we'll bring you back later. And that's a little if your question, it's divided, it evolves around state law, and it may also, depending on the, your state, um, affect the unemployment op, um, options. So um, you're actually better off laying people off ultimately. Um, but you can always give them, the, the, if you lay them off, you're not even required to pay them in most states. Um, any of their accrued um, sick leave or vacation leave, some states are required to immediately pay all of it. So I would look at, talk to your employees. I mean, the idea is that, you know, one of our uh, members once said, you know, the most valuable asset he has in his own company, walk out of the door every night. Um, and so you want to keep those relationships up. Um, so you just work with your employees, find out what's best for them, try to accommodate them the best you can. Um, if they, use, if they don't use their vacation um, or personal time off leave, that's fine. If they want to use it to, to supplement their income, they can do that as well. Uh, Steve or Jeffrey, the one, I think this is covered in the document, uh, Steve, that you put there. But uh, Keith asks, is general liability and workers' comp forgivable from the PPP loan? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, just the payroll portions of it. Um, that would that would be an expense that would qualify, I think, under the general business expenses, but it's not one that's forgivable. It's not a payroll well, line. It's, uh, in fact, it's not a lot. It's yeah, it's it's not even included in the general business expenses, whether it's forgivable. But the payroll taxes are, and so in some states they include a workers' comp and an unemployment payment 
and that is forgivable if you used it for that. So you got to look at what your state um, uh, local tax assessments include. So whatever the state employment taxes, again, the vast majority of them include a, an unemployment portion of it. So that should be forgivable. A part of that payment, using that for payment, so long as all of those business expenses do not exceed 25% of the total loan, um, then, and the rest of it goes to wages, you know, or payroll costs, I should say, um, then you're probably fine. And in fact, if it is included in the state payroll taxes, then that's even part of the 75%. And then you're only left say, with uh, basically your utilities, rent, um, interest on, on loans and such of that nature. Okay. We're kind of getting a live play by play with Barbara. She's going back and forth with her insurance agent, but she said that uh, the agent said that when they deny a claim, it doesn't remain open no matter what changes may or may not happen. That may differ from insurance carrier to insurance carrier or from state to state. Uh, but again, we would just encourage you if possible to go ahead and apply for that and submit the claim and, and see what happens. At least you've done your due process. You, you have two options here. You can let it go there, but at least now it's quite clear you filed a timely claim. They can't come back until we didn't file the claim timely. I would keep track of it. So if the law does change, you immediately renew that claim. Secondly, you have a right to keep the claim open by simply appealing the denial. Mm. That's good. That's key. That's key. All right, guys, uh, as you're continuing to submit questions, I just want to update you again on what is available on the www.wfca.org site. Uh, if you go there, the first thing you'll see is a coronavirus response section. Click on that. You'll see information from this webinar and the previous webinars, recordings of that, uh, responses to questions that have been asked, legislative updates, uh, calls to action, things that you need to do, things you'd be involved in, state-by-state -state guidelines, a Canadian response page. Uh, certainly one of the most utilized sections of that is the FAQ section, the frequently asked questions. Jeff has responded to probably 50 individual questions that have come to him. It's not even part of his, his responsibilities, but he's done it because he stepped up knowing we're all in this together. And as he responds to those, we simply take that Q&A and we add it to the frequently asked questions. Our, our marketing partner, uh, TK Fusion, makes sure that that is up to date. So you've got all that information available to you uh, in the FAQ section. Likely, if you've got a question before you even pick up the phone to call us, you're welcome to do that. But the first thing you should do is go to that page and see if your question is not already answered. Uh, information about the SBA loans, um, the business interruption insurance, again, that will be available to you and, and places where you can uh, go to your states and encourage them to uh, extend your rights in that regard with business interruption insurance. Uh, Jeff, I know that I recently asked you what are the five things that you would tell a retailer? What are the five things they need to do? Uh, you don't have to recite those verbatim, but if you were on the retail side right now, it, what are the key things that need to be done? First of all, probably foremost, um, uh, file for the loans that you think you need. PPP loan is almost a no-brainer other than the delays in getting it. Um, because it's forgivable if you use it correctly, okay? That's the number one thing to do. Um, I think number two is um, look at your state programs. They may give you some real opportunities to get additional uh, money to cover you through this um, very trying time period. Um, three, I would um, look at unemployment as an option as well, um, particularly as uh, either prior to getting the PPP loan or after the loan has, um, has been, the eight weeks of the loan period has expired. Um, I would uh, file a, uh, a business interruption claim as well. I know we've talked about that. Um, I would talk to my bank. Many banks have you required on your line of credit to um, tell them of any unusual circumstances or things that affect the ratios and, and sort of the conditions of the loan. I don't want you suddenly finding your bank saying, oh, we're calling your entire loan because you didn't give us advice. Just work with them, okay? I would also be very cautious about fraud right now. One of the fastest growing frauds right now is um, uh, clearinghouse fraud, which is where the banks clear. To, to perpetrate a fraud, all anybody needs is your checking account number and the routing number, and they can 
claim money off of your account. Most of you think, well, I check my bank statement every month. There's no problem with that. Don't I have 60 days to do it? You do as an individual, but as a business, you have 24 hours to correct it. Mm. So that's something you're, you know, you're scrambling just to keep yourself afloat right now uh, and worrying. But I would also check those bank statements every morning. Jeff, I've got a good question here. Uh, I know we're wrapping up on our time, but is there any truth to the uh, belief that an SBA loan that was applied for before April 1st, that they did not record that and that you have to apply again? I don't know about that. The answer is that there's two things in the, in the PPP loan on it, okay? One is that if you've gotten the loan between those two days, be, be, um, since uh, uh, January, is it January 15th, I think, I have to go back to the dates. Um, if you have gotten one, um, then it's gonna be added on to your PPP loan. So in addition to the 2.5, you'll get that as part of it. Um, whether that's obligated or, or, or not, we have yet to understand. Two, if you applied for an emergency loan, then they'll roll that loan into your PPP loan. Um, so, um, so long as that loan is for something different than that eight weeks of coverage, um, and is intended to be used for something else, um, then you can have both a PPP loan and these emergency disaster loans. Yeah, and I think her concern is that she's not heard anything back and she's wondering since she applied before April 1st, and she does say that she has an application number, does she need to apply again after April 1st? Uh, I need to know whether, I, the answer is I check up on it. So if you applied through your, uh, 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 what's called a 7A bank, that's a bank who, can, who is already authorized to give out these loans. Um, and that would have been certainly would have been a requirement prior to April 1st. Um, I would go ask. The, I would contact the, 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 the bank immediately. They're overwhelmed. It's hard to get. You're going to be on a hotline forever. But you can at least go online. You should be allowed to go online with, that, with the uh, application number and track the loan as well on the SBA uh, site as well. But again, those... I don't know if you've got, tried to get out of these sites. Um, there are sites you can't even get on there. They're so overloaded right Very now. Um, so I would try all those tracks, uh, tax to check on that loan because that loan may still be available to you and they may still be processing it. I guess we will continue to update you. We, we plan on having a webinar like this every week, especially while things are so fluid and as legislation is being updated, we're getting information. We're constantly sending communications out, so be on the lookout for those. But we will give you the time for the live Q&A every week, and we'll try to do that consistently on Thursdays at this time, if at all possible. Remember to go to our website, access the website. And again, most of the information that you're asking is not something that's simply impacting you. It's impacting others within the industry. We're all in this together. I will say that the associations are banding together and helping in any way they can. They're sharing information with each other so that they can list that on the websites. I have a conference call every week with, with other association heads and we get together and talk about what we're doing, sharing information uh, again, because we are all in this together. We're looking out for what's best for the entire industry. If you're not a member of the WFCA, we encourage you to join. Again, there is no cost to that. We would love to have your voice combined with our voices. Obviously, the more people we represent, the louder our voice is heard in Washington, D.C. and at the state level. So we encourage you, go to our website if you're not a member and join. If you are a member and you know someone who's not, encourage them to be a part of this voice as well. Guys, anything you would add as we close up? The, the, I'm the only one that's not going to add anything big time here, but the one thing I want you to know is when you calculate your payroll cost, remember you have to use regular rates. So if you've lowered that rate recently, um, it's the average rate over that time. If you have people that are in peace uh, work, uh, paid that way at employees, you have to calculate it through a regular rate system, and that's a very different system. If you have people with um, are on salary, um, but they have varying hours, so they don't have an hourly rate number, you're going to have to go back and look at those as well. So there are some requirements on when you start to calculate what your payroll was for that prior 12 months. Um, and what and what's going to be considered um, um, your normal? What would be your average rate on that? So just be careful of that. I want to make sure everybody's um, cognizant of that issue, um, and particularly that's true for part-time employees since um, they have varying hours. So just look at it, make sure you're correct, and um, you should be fine with it. All right, thank you, Jeff, and and Ashley from our team has reminded me just to reiterate and clarify. 
primary membership under the WFCA is free. If you're an associate member, obviously, because of the discount you get at services and the access to our ever increasing membership, then uh, we have not increased our fees whatsoever. There, that is still a paid membership, but primary membership is free. Uh, so again, we ask you and encourage you to be a part of our membership so we can combine your voice with our own. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Again, if you have questions in the meantime, certainly you can email us, uh, call us, uh, but uh, obviously access and utilize our website whenever possible, wfca.org. We're all in this together. God bless you. Stay tight and uh, we'll get through this and uh, we'll look back one day and go, we were a part of that and we're different because of it. But if we do this right, we'll be better because of it as well. Thank you very much. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank you.